other factors to look at with informants is what is their relationship to the subjects? Are they a family member? Is there a spousal privilege? The federal courts recognize several uh, privileges, the attorney-client privilege, the spousal privilege, a psychotherapist privilege, and a government informant privilege. Uh, while some communications may not be officially recognized, such as a penitent priest privilege, having a, a minister provide you information uh, may may not be the best uh, source of information for you and there may be some issues uh, with that or vice versa the penitent giving information against the the minister type of situation just be careful with that uh, as you're dealing with the criminal informant informant management there should be a case file on the informant each informant needs to have their own file with their own identification number. The identification number is used in official documents to, to disclose that this information came from an informant and who that informant was. That way we can track the informant's uh, history of information that's been provided and show the reliability of that informant over time. The case file should have the true name of the informant, their criminal history, the crimes that they've committed, uh, if they've served time, whatever, we need to know what their criminal history is. Other personal information, where they work, where they live, family members, things of that nature, is, is helpful to know for the informant. In the event you may have to go after the informant sometimes, you need to know where to start looking. Also, documentation of each contact with the informant. Each time the informant is contacted, there should be a record of interview made on that contact and also a payment history. Whenever the informant is paid, um, we should have a record of that payment. And again, we can show if we're asked by the court how many times that informant's been paid. And part of that goes to reliability. If an informant's giving good information, they're getting paid the, the better information, the better pay. So that tends to enhance the credibility of the informant. In high level cases, I have seen where they have added, given an informant two numbers to conceal their identity. There could be a concern with this, however, if you're using the same informant, but two numbers to establish probable cause, it may appear to a judge that you have two different informants, which means it, it appears to be more credible. You need to at least identify to the judge that these two informant numbers identify the same informant. Informants should be assigned a primary and secondary handler. They should uh, have all contacts with the primary, but the secondary is there in case something should happen to the primary the secondary can take over. Also, the uh, any contacts should always have two officers present. Any payments should be with two officers present to note that the informant was paid. You know, they were given five hundred dollars. You, know, you have two people to back that up. You know, the problem with with uh, ethical issues with an officer taking five hundred dollars out to pay an informant paying him $100 and keeping the rest for himself or paying him $100 and saying, I'll give you $100 again next week, trying to spread this out a little bit, uh, could get into some ethical issues. Rules of engagement. As the informant works, there may be a time when to add credibility to the informant you look for permission for the informant to commit a crime. One of the concerns about that is uh, that when you're giving permission for this person to commit a crime, uh, how many are they going to commit? You know, one for me, one for you type of thing. You're going to give them permission to steal one piece of equipment, and they steal three. They don't tell you about the other two. 
the other issue is entrapment. Is entrapment is a defense that's that's raised, and the defendant always comes up and says, "Well, you know what? The government paid this informant to come in and do this, and they entrap me. They entice me to commit the crime as well." So the prosecution needs to be ready for this and and know how they're going to handle this should this defense arise and it will when you have a, an informant out there committing crimes also intelligence gathering uh, making the informant aware that they're not to commit crimes to gather information for example committing a burglary to obtain information could first of all the information you could receive could also violate the fourth amendment because the informant's working for you uh, the court could hold that that was a governmental intrusion without without a warrant violating the Fourth Amendment. Also, pressure on a subject to talk. The informant using pressure could constitute coercion and violate a constitutional right as well. So making sure the informant stays within their bounds as well when gathering information. Ethical issues. Be aware of becoming intimate with the informants. This is a law enforcement criminal relationship. Keep it that way. They're not your friend. They're not your business associate. Don't become intimate business or socially with these informants. Also, as you work with an informant, you do become close to them and you may begin to overestimate the veracity of the information they're providing. Keep a clear head on this. This is why you want a secondary handler. This is why you want to go with your supervisor, through your supervisor, on this information to, to get a fresh set of eyes on this that's not biased and can, can more objectively look at the evidence to make sure that the information provided is is good information and that you're not overlooking something. There's a strong potential for being duped by an informant. In fact, if you work with informants, you're gonna be duped at least once, probably other times as, as well, and accept that. Uh, when you know that you've been duped, you, you confront it, you let them know, hey, you know what, you got by me this time, it's not gonna happen again. Uh, I even had on an occasion where I just had to quit using an informant uh, because I, I just I told him I can't trust you anymore. Engaging in unethical or illegal behaviors on behalf of the informant. Now this goes the other way. Now, instead of the informant conducting illegal activity, the informant has done something and you're trying to cover your informant by doing something that's unethical or something that may even be illegal. Uh, again, one of the things you have to be concerned with in, in this case is this goes back to being duped. You th now think you have an obligation to do that, and when you do that, you could very well uh, put yourself in, in criminal uh, court, and you could be the defendant because you were trying to protect a criminal informant. Using coercion and intimidation to force cooperation. Dealing with the informant, you want them to give you good information, but, but also you have to consider that you can't use coercion or intimidation to force them to cooperate. The more intimidation and coercion you force on them, they, the more they want to please you and the less reliable the information is but also a key ethical issue, especially if it has to go to court and it comes out that you force the informant to do something. And a final one is a lawsuit for failure to protect. Be careful with what you say to an informant. If you promise an informant that they will not be disclosed and they are in fact disclosed and there's harm that comes to them, that could be a liability issue. 